Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to our digital pathology seminar at the 112th uh, USCAP annual meeting. My name is uh, Jean-François Pomerol. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Tribune Health. For those uh, who are not familiar with Tribune Health, our company offers AI powered digital pathology and telepathology solutions. We have been developing informatics a solution for pathology labs since our creation 15 years ago. And we had a quarter in Paris with a subsidiary in Canada, one in the US, and we have now a customer in Europe and in North America. Our team is very proud and excited to be part of this digital revolution, both in diagnostic and drug discovery. And we strive continuously to innovate and to provide solutions to support the work of pathologists and to improve the patient outcomes. Our image management solution, called Calopix, has been awarded in 2023 for the second year in a row, best-in-class solution for digital pathology, demonstrating, demonstrating its value for customer. Let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Scott Kilpatrick is a professor of pathology at the Cleveland Clinic, where he serves as director of orthopedic pathology and co-director of e-pathology. He specializes in diagnosing bone and soft tissue diseases, both neoplastic and non-neoplastic, and has published extensively on the subject. He earned a BS in biology from the University of Georgia and an MD from the Medical College of Georgia. After completing his residency in anatomic and clinical pathology at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center, he pursued a fellowship in bone and soft tissue pathology at the Mayo Clinic. Prior to joining the Cleveland Clinic, he held academic appointment at Wake Forest University and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. His research focuses on diseases of the skeleton and connective tissues with a particular interest in clinical pathological analysis and the use of fine needle aspiration biopsy. Dr. Kilpatrick has authored over 100 publications, book chapters, and, and a textbook entitled Diagnostic Muscu Musculoskeletal Surgical Pathology. Dr. Kilpatrick will talk today to us about his experience implementing digital pathology at the Cleveland Clinic and share his team's first-hand experiences with the technology. We talk about successes and the cost associated with the implementation of this technology. In addition, he will touch upon the use of our Teleslide software for secondary consultation with international partners, highlighting its effectiveness within their daily practice. Finally, Dr. Kilpatrick will offer his perspective on the future of digital pathology and the trends he anticipates will emerge in the field. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Scott Kilpatrick. Okay, can uh, everyone hear me okay? I walk around the stage a lot, so that's just you know out of habit. So anyway, let me tell you a little bit about myself and what I really hope to accomplish um, here. What I want to talk to you about is my experience in, in, in the Cleveland Clinic in digital pathology, where we are now, um, what we're currently investigating, where we think we're going, how we're viewing uh, primary diagnosis, some of the barriers to that that, that we've had. Um, but even if you're not ready for primary diagnosis, I hope you'll see some ways that digital pathology might value your, you at your institution and even within uh, your lab. So one important piece of information about me, so I started my career in academics, um, was director of surgical pathology at UNC Chapel Hill. I spent a little over a decade in private practice where we owned a lab. So uh, that's gonna become important because I can tell you that when, um, when we started looking at digital pathology when I was in private practice, we just didn't think at that time, just about that it was financially feasible. I do think that's changing. Um, I do think there's an evolution, and AI will probably be part of that uh, evolution that will make us uh, look into this further. It'll make it financially feasible uh, for a lot of institutions. 
Um, when I joined the Cleveland Clinic uh, 2017, I came, became director, co-director of e-pathology, and then this past November, I actually became medical director of the Cleveland Clinic Laboratories, which is our, our anatomic pathology consult and outreach uh, services. So we'll go over that a little bit more shortly, but anyway. Okay, so just uh, briefly, um, Cleveland Clinic has, this, of course, a mission statement and enterprise priorities. And one of the things that changed uh, really right before the pandemic was telemedicine, of course, we think of this as telepathology, became a priority for the clinic, right? But the clinic moves slowly, it's like a huge ship, right? We're kind of moving slowly to try to navigate into this area, even though we've been in this space for quite a while. The background of e-pathology to Cleveland Clinic really started in 2009. In 2009, um, basically uh, under the leadership of uh, Dr. Wally Hendricks and um, also under uh, the leadership of Tom Bauer, who's now head at, I apologize for the, <laughs> I don't know whether to speak loud or not. Um, this, the system was started, right? And at that time, it was predominantly, and I'll try to get over here to show you this. Um, most of what we started with was in this arena the academic area, right? Included education research. That's the low hanging fruit for us. So we were using this to present at conferences. Uh, we were being asked uh, for research opportunities and that was where we predominantly sat. We also used it in the legal world, right? We didn't want to send original slides. Digital pathology represented a good way to preserve the slide, but send it for legal consultation. Technical side, as of now, and this has been going on for several years now, all the special stain slide controls are scanned and sent as a link to all the pathologists. So I may order an AFB, but my control is now a digital slide. I get a link at the end of the day for all those. On the IHC side, we're not scanning all the IHCs, but every pathologist, particularly those that go out to the regional hospitals that we cover, has the opportunity to have the IHC that they order scanned as an EPAS slide, right? It kind of makes sense because we were having trouble. So I don't know exactly what your practices are, but we have a main campus at the Cleveland Clinic and then we have, I want to say 11 regional hospitals that surround it. We have pathologists that work at main campus and sometimes regional and they'll go out there and if they order an immuno, then somehow we've got to get it out there. Maybe they're coming back the next day. So it's been a huge problem. This has solved that problem. They can order it as a digital slide, go out, do their work, and it's available for them to sign out. That's all the low hanging fruit, right? That's what we're doing. Over here on the professional side, international and domestic market, mainly on the consultative side is where we've been focusing. Initially starting with the international consultative side. Okay? And that's where I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, our relationship with Tribune Health and how that's evolved in that. We've also started dabbling in the domestic consult slide, right? And we're beginning to move towards primary diagnosis using lessons that we've learned from other institutions. I'm gonna talk to you about what I think other institutions are doing. It's a great job, but I also wanna talk to you about some of the barriers I think that maybe moving too soon with, with pathologists can cause problems. So um, just for some clarification, uh, I, I don't know where everyone is in the audience, um, but there's a lot of terms in digital path that get used interchangeably, okay? Telepathology, of course, is a broad term, refers to any time that we're viewing pathology from a remote, right? When people use the word digital path, which they often use synonymous with telepath, what they're usually referring to is virtual microscopy, right? We're talking about the development of a whole slide image, usually scanned at a 20 to 40 X, that requires some sort of manipulative software, right? Like for example, eSlide Manager or Tribune Calipix Teleslide. Um, it can also be a source of static images. Of course, static images do represent virtual microscopy and that's how we still often communicate. But on the other flip side, we also have robotic microscopy, which involves live stream view viewing. Slides aren't stored, right? This is an image we're viewing real time. And we're also using this technology. So a lot of times when we're talking about digital pathology, people are referring to robotic microscopy, not virtual, and I wanna make that dis distinction because there are some good areas that robotic microscopy can work very well. To be sure, some scanners actually allow both. They allow you to do robotic microscopy and they allow you to do virtual microscopy. So one of the areas that we found to be very successful 
uh, represents a solution to the frustration that if you're working at a hospital here in the United States that covers more than one, you have this problem, right? When I was in private practice, same issue. We have a main area, we have regional hospitals. Those regional hospitals occasionally need frozen section coverage. How do you cover those hospitals, right? You send a pathologist out there for a surgery scheduled at 9 a.m. It shows up at 11 or 12, sometimes even later than that. Meanwhile, you have to remember to take these slides with you and so forth. So one of the things we started at main campus, mainly for after hours and regional frozens, was to take a scanner, put it in there, and allow us to at least cover frozen sections on weekends and in the evenings remotely. But it requires a resident to come in, gross that specimen, load that uh, um, specimen onto a slide, cut it, and then produce the frozen. We still have that, right? And I don't know what other countries require, but the obstacle is you need somebody per CLIA requirements that meet certain educational criteria to do that. We played around with the PA and that ended up being a disaster. For the same reason we get frustrated, but we can carry slides with us, but a PA would show up there, wait for two or three hours. Meanwhile, we really need them back at main campus where all the, the gross is being done. It didn't work out at all. So we've moved in that arena towards tech support, but again, hiring techs who meet, like a med tech, for example, would meet the educational requirements for that. But that's your, you're gonna find when you start to do this, that's gonna be your rate limiting factor. We bought 11 of these Motec Easy Scan scanners, one slide part that, are, that act as a robotic micro, microscope, as well as a scanner. Um, those have been fine, but that pre-COVID, I'll tell you, we're just now starting to get people hired out into the region. But on main campus, it's worked beautifully. I have not been in to do a frozen section in the middle of the night or on the weekends, and it's not because they're not occurring um, in almost four years now because of this. But I thank the residents every day because they're the ones that are coming in that are allowing me to actually do this. But we are moving this out to our regions. But this is an example of robotic microscopy that I think in most cases people would agree can be a, at least a quality enhancer to your practice if you're faced with this. So we all know kind of this. I have to remind people of this. Sometimes I even remind administration that at the end of the day, unlike radiology, we still got to create a glass slide, right? We still need all the personnel that were there before to make a glass slide. Then we need other personnel to clean those slides, load those slides, collect those slides off it. We need the hardware and the software to do it. And of course, this also kind of integrates with the final diagnosis report. We're going to go over this and potentially AI. And just to look at it on, from another standpoint, Still creating glass slide, incremental significant investment. We're going to talk about this. That's a dis real big distinguishing factor from radiology. The other thing that I will tell you that a lot of places that have started this are finding is storage. So again, I was in private practice. I can tell you some of the places I've talked to are looking at a cost of a million a year for storing all the, all the archival slides as well as the slides they currently have. And that's not a cost that's one time. That's potentially a cost that's every year. I can tell you, you can put blocks in an air-conditioned facility. You can buy a lot for a million dollars. Probably everybody's institution here, we could store a lot of blocks. Again, just a, it's an important barrier, but you should be aware of this. The files are huge. To give you an idea of how big a digital slide is, a 40X slide scanned is bigger than a whole body CT scan. So we're dealing with you know, fairly large uh, files. And there, there are a number of, of companies that are working to see if we can manage these files, compress them without losing the details and so forth, but it's still something you've got to consider. Here's the, the thing that I think will eventually drive this is artificial intelligence, because it requires whole slot imaging, and that will eventually, I think, drive us in that direction. So as we've been going through this, we've learned a lot, and I'd like to share kind of what we've learned on the hardware and software side. We started with AT turbo scanners, and that lasted for over a decade. They were the workhorses, mainly education research, um, and we did dabble, like I said, into the consultative environment, but that didn't really involve them. And we used Aperio eSlide Manager as our, as our pathology man management system, and that worked very well for a while, okay? But there was one problem. Education research, no problem at all. Now that we wanted to get into consultative, when we first started doing this, and we started with, like China was a big one we started with because they couldn't send their, it was against the law to send their blocks overseas, right out of the country. Um, what we found was related to this. So you may wonder, what are these different file formats I see? Probably the one you see the, hear about the most is SVS. Well, these are all proprietary file formats that were developed by each scanner company that was specific to that scanner. 
And that worked well. There wasn't a solution. We couldn't use JPEG or TIFF. They, was, I mean, these were very big files. But the problem it created was when we first started to go out and solicit consults is that I would have to come to you and say, I would, you know, I'd, I'd pitch Cleveland Clinic, what we could do, the depth of our expertise, but you got to buy a Leica scanner. <laughs> you, you already bought your Hamamatsu, you're perfectly happy with it, or your 3D stick, but now you got to buy a Leica scanner because we can't communicate otherwise, right? So that was the problem. And then you sort of fast forward into the mid 2000s, a lot of companies started to develop a middleware that was scanner agnostic, right? That became very critical to allowing us to branch out. So, um, what happened? Well, um, I want to say probably around 2010, 2011, I was co-director of EPATH at the time, you know, or, or, or predating me as co-director, co co I think that was more towards 2016. We began to look at a solution for this on the China side. We found a company named Ben Sheng that we worked along with who had a software that allowed any scanner in China, any, any, any file format to be able to be put into this cloud-based system and we could read it on our side. So it solved that type of issue for us because eSlide Manager couldn't solve it. And then of course, what happened was, okay, that's great in China. We don't have somebody outside of China that can provide us that same level of service. So we went through, we looked at a lot of different vendors and, and I, I should say one disclosure so you know, Cleveland Clinic's paying my way here, you know, not to review, not anybody else. But, I, you know, but they ended up being the front runner for us for a lot of different reasons. One is, I like the fact that they were based in France because when you get into the international market, we wanted someone who understood the different languages that we may have to be involved with, medical translation, so forth. That was what Ben Sheng was doing for us in China, right? And we had excellent customer service. So Tribune uh, Health Teleslide became our consultative cloud-based software for sharing files, right, um, uh, from different from, from different countries outside of China. Um, and that's how we got with them. Path AI, recently Cleveland Clinic has formed a relation with Path AI, but this has predominantly been on the research front, looking at algorithms and so forth, um, having access to our, our slide repository. Um, and we're also working with them on a viewer, but they're really not in the clinical arena per se yet. Okay, so another advantage we've actually had is we've had an opportunity to evaluate a lot of scanners. And I'll show you something you may not be aware of. Remember we started with two Leica AT turbos. We went and evaluated a lot of scanners at a lot of places we visited. We purchased two 3D Histotech P250 scanners. And as a result of our relationship with Path AI, we also got Leica ATs, Leica GT450s, Philips, and a Roche scanner. It was interesting, and we began to validate these scanners. And what you'll find, and I'm not here to tell you which scanner to get, okay, but I'll show you something kind of interesting. So each scanner has different light sources, right? They have a different default image that they produce. And one thing I noticed, I'm a bone and soft tissue pathologist, so when I was validating the GT450, I'm looking at a lipoma, and I couldn't really, you know, I'm used to being at 2X and 4X, and I was scanning around trying to find the big atypical cells that I would go down and look a little further to, to confirm is that an atypical lipoma is too well. I'm just having a struggle time and I thought it was related to the scan. Well, it turns out they're different contrasts and you see that well, same image scanned on different scanners, different levels of contrast, not any different than the H&E slides that you'll see from different institutions, right? We've all seen this. They send you slides, it's slightly different. Some of it's like a little more pink, a little more blue. But again, I think this is something to think about when you start to buy scanners. It's been one of the advantages we've had of having all these in-house, validating them all, to see which ones we have tended to like the best. I will also tell you that um, whenever we're evaluating um, any type of hardware or software, it's a team approach. So our technical people are evaluating. It had to be continuous load, right? That was one of the, the things are, but it's a team approach to it. But we, in, we engage the pathologist as well. Which one do you like the best? What, do you, what, what produces the best result uh, for you? Because ultimately we're talking about a patient care issue. Um, I also think there's some very good articles out there um, of experiences people have had that, that, that can guide us. And we're certainly paying attention to this as well as we dabble into this. Um, and this recently, uh, in the archives of Pathology Lab Medicine, there was a very good article published from Stanford as they've moved into the primary diagnosis of digital pathology um, and what they've learned along the way. So they've scanned about 80% of their surgical path volume 
in, in, as whole slide images on a daily basis. There's some things that they're, they're they absolutely not scanning. We're going to go over that. Um, they typically, you know, they took the sort of FDA cleared um, Philips scanner, from what I understand, and also the, the the computers that were associated with that monitors and provided those to faculty for both offsite and onsite. So it's a significant investment, and I'm going to tell you why I think that's very important uh, in a moment. Um, Again, you kind of see 94,000 surgical cases, daily average 751 blocks. We have about two and a, well, more than two times that number. Of, we're more at 200,000 um, slides right now, not including the consult cases. Um, and they were recognized that there were adoptions that had to occur, adjustments in workflow flexibility that I think if you start to move, you have to be prepared for. It's the kind of thing we're already having talks on now and moving in small steps. What were their operational challenges? Um, one was outside consultations. You know, the, what you get on a digital pass slide is only as good as what's put in there, right? You can't make a glass slide better, you know? Actually, it probably makes it worse when you scan a bad slide. Um, so they noticed that was one issue, was on the consultations, it was somewhat problematic. Specimens that were, that were subject to fragmentation, like endocervical curatage specimens, endometrial curatage specimens, sometimes there was lack of detection of those pieces. We've known about this for a long time. That was somewhat problematic. They excluded cytology, bone marrow, aspirates, whole mount, prostate was excluded, at least for now, from their digital pathology. I found this data the most interesting because I've always thought that, you know, when you hear about digital path, there's a lot of hype out there and then there's reality, right? So it's sometimes hard to separate. I've seen lectures by people that have never done anything in digital pathology, but from looking at the lecture, you'd think, oh, they're really invested. They don't, you know, so it's, you got to kind of separate that out. What I liked about Stanford's data is they gave, gave us good data on what it took to scan all that volume in, even on the FTE side. So by the time it was all said and done, they had eight scanners, six entirely dedicated to histology, and each scanner required about an additional 1.5 FTE per scanner, right? So we're basically, you know, uh, looking at, what, 12 additional FTEs to get that volume scanned in. Um, there's no way you can't add the time with digital pathology. In other words, uh, you know, we're going to talk about pluses and minuses. So slide scanning added approximately three hours to the overall turnaround time as a result of that. Um, on the consultative side, it was an additional 24 hours due to workflow staff availability and labeling. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think they gave a lot of people choices of whether they want consult cases scanned in. We had talked about b that being the first thing, but after thinking about it and thinking about their experience, I think that's not going to be where we I think we're going to go to the region first because I, I do recognize the staining patterns of outside consult cases being different. And that, I think that could cause us problems. So. Um, as we move into um, primary diagnosis, and we're not here yet, we're looking at this, um, in the US, there's no doubt in my mind, the big driver is gonna be, does it integrate with Epic Beaker? I mean, virtually every place I've worked using, using that. That's not a barrier, obviously, that some of the places we visited had in Canada, in Europe, but for us, that's going to be the key, right? And this was an example. So Tom Bowers at the Hospital for Special Surgery, um, they've integrated into uh, Epic Beaker. They were using the software Sectra to do that. Sectra was a radiology software. Oh, Epic! Oh, Epic Beaker is the LIS system um, within a, the electronic medical record of Epic, for a lack of a better way. It is the laboratory system um, that's. And basically, Epic is, how do I say this, the, the, the big person on the street for, for, for most hospitals in the United States have moved towards that, right? And it has the ability to, there's some pluses to it, it has the ability to, to integrate hospital to hospital. They have, you know, mechanisms of sharing data. If you go to one hospital in L.A., you come to a Cleveland Clinic. So, I'm sorry, that's what, yeah, Epic Beaker is that lab, is the LIS system. Most of us, when I, the, private, it, the, the private practice I was in, um, was part of a big place called Navant Health, completely private. Navant Health went completely Epic Beaker. Cleveland Clinic's gone completely Epic Beaker. Every place that I've worked in my past has gone in that direction. So it's going to be important for ultimately whatever software you choose. And this is different. Now, I should also preface this by telling you that when I first started here, I thought I'm going to do the one-stop shop. I don't think that's necessary. You know, I think you can have 
different softwares, different hardware doing different things because they do that particularly good. So this is only about how we're going to integrate in primary diagnosis. And that's what hospital special surgery's done. Now, what do I like about that? Um, if you have a system that integrates in Epic Beaker, you have an opportunity to do a lot of stuff. That is share files with clinicians, which has become very popular, Hospital for Special Surgery. And this is courtesy of Dr. Tom Bowers. Et but you can bring up radiographs while you've got the path up while you're looking at the clinical history, right? I'm already in the system. I don't have to have two separate screens necessarily to look at it all. It's already integrated uh, into the system. So it's a huge advantage. And again, I would say most pathologists are not necessarily crazy that Epic Beaker has sort of been thrust on it, but it is just reality. It's where we are now and it's where it's got to go. Now, one of the things I think that is, um, that we've learned, and I would say I learned a lot by a visit when we were going to, when we were thinking about Tribune at the time, they were, um, we went to CHUM, a hospital in Montreal, University of Montreal, um, who had taken four pathologists and completely integrated them into digital. Now, Chum did a lot more of this beyond the scope of this lecture in terms of bringing digital all the way from things like taking pictures of small like GI biopsies as opposed to having them gross. A, a lot of cool stuff of bringing digital pathology from accessioning all the way through to the pathologist. So it was a big picture type thing. But what they did what, to, to, for pathologist office infrastructure, I thought was cool, and I thought that is how you sell it. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do now. So one of the frustration pathologists have, in my view, is that when I talk to pathologists about adopting digital, it's not that they're so against it, but I have a $15,000 microscope in my, very nice, BX43 microscope. I've got you know, a polarizer attached to it for looking at gout crystals or whatnot, right? Um, and then I have a $1,500 computer with eight gigabytes of RAM, very standard resolution, small screen, and so someone comes to you and says, I want you to do your patient care on that, you know, you all of a sudden feel inadequate, right? When I went to Chum and I was visiting um, Chum, I kind of realized for the first time, this was about four, I could do digital path, right? Now, do you really need a 38 inch 6K monitor? No, but it was really nice. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you. All of a sudden, mitotic figures, neutrophils, everything was so easy to see. But not only that, they didn't just do that. So um, all our offices are stand, have a standard 100 megabytes per second coming into them, right? So now my office now has a gigabyte. Huge difference, right? Even with it, you know. I've also learned that it's not necessarily, um, you don't need 6K, but you need big. Size matters in digital pathology. If you're really trying size and speed, if you're really trying to get pathologists to adopt to it, you need to invest into their um, uh, office infrastructure, and that's what Stanford did. I would take it a step further if it were me, but that's just me. But, but I think Stanford did that right. Invested in office, they didn't just say, okay, here's a square peg and I'm gonna bang it into a round hole because you guys are gonna do digital path. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the resistance has come in because as we've been rolling out people's offices to upgrade it, big difference in the way people have accepted it and wanted to move forward with this. So just to kind of give you some ideas about, you know, that so and it was another thing that was kind of cool um, was you know they also thought about the residents here so they have not only a dual headed microscope but there's a nice little 24 inch monitor sitting on the side so that when the pathologist is going through the slides the resident has their own monitor again a lot of money was spent on this but a lot of thought went in, in it went into it too and I, and I really like that and I, I'll tell you one it, I'm hoping that you can take home some of the things I've said today because a lot of what we've a lot of what I've taught you, we've learned from other people. And this was a great example, and we're rolling this forward sort of as we speak. So this just sort of summarizes some of which you already know, but some things I think probably should be emphasized more. You know, there's, we all know the benefits of, uh, you know, experience with digital pathology, right? Ability to share images immediately for second opinions. For us at Cleveland Clinic, another, another driver has been the clinic desires to bring the expertise at main campus to the region. 
one way to do that, as opposed to planning a general pathologist out there, if they want me to look at a revision arthroplasty from an orthopedic surgeon, which I know the general pathologist is happy to let me do, right? They want me to do that, make it available for me at main campus. I can look at it the same day while I'm covering. So there's some things like that that I think are really beneficial. I don't think that it always has to be cost, but cost is always part of the equation. So you have to have reasons why you're moving forward when you go to administration, right? There's opportunities, uh, uh, as we've already talked about, for special staying controls, IHC. Again, if you're in a place where there's regional coverage and you're having to travel out there, fantastic. And of course, we know that this can take away courier costs, FedEx, worries of lost or broken slides. There's a lot of huge advantages. And of course, I put AI at the bottom, which ultimately will make its way to the top, right? Challenges, um, experienced pathologists, most of us would say we're still faster with glass. Even though I've done a lot of digital pathology, I still like glass, but I'm, you know, as we get more and more experience and the fact that it, it gives us an additional way to view it, people are buying into it, right? I can do a frozen section um, remotely that if you had calculated, the, it, yes, it may be slower while I'm looking at it, but if you calculate the time it takes me to drive out there, wait around and come back, it m more than covers it. So realize that some types of cases are gonna be more difficult than others. Um, speaking of revision arthroplasty where you look for neutrophils, that's kind of hard and that's where I really want the high resolution monitor, right? But in other cases where I'm not really spending much time below 10x, per, you know, perfect. There, there's, there are things that can be solved, but you just have to be aware of it going in. I probably should put that at the point because I really think the investment in office infrastructure is so important to getting pathologists buy-in. Because you remember, you're affecting their lifestyle, right? I mean, at the end of the day, yes, you've given the ability to do things remotely, but we still have to be on site for a lot of stuff that we do. You know, you can't just say, we can't just send all our pathologists home with other, other investments we have to do. Significant investment into the lab and FTEs, you can't go into this without that knowledge. You know, again, it might not be the driver, but you need to understand that. And don't forget the cost of storage, which I think ultimately in big institutions may end up being your biggest cost of all. Okay, so that's it. I hope that kind of gave you an overview of where we are. There are a lot of people out here who are further along than we are, right? but at least I can kind of give you some ideas of what we're doing, why we're doing it, and, and where we're going with it. So anyway, thank you.